spent four years taking photographs only in mirrors, which I was constantly bending. I built a mirrored room with, uh, say, a hexagonal, hexagonal room you know, covered with uh, mylar. Uh, and uh, in these reflections, I made my photographs, you know? Yeah, I'd say there are a lot of images that are suppressed, you know, that are in yeah. the unconscious. People come to them sometimes through certain special experiences, certain kind of intensity. Yeah. Concerning our theme, what is political, uh, Ira's work and everything he's done and he's lived was highly political. Uh, there was a part of him as a, a, a cineast, I mean, a film director, independent film director, photographer, poet, writer, performance artist uh, that was uh, that he spent most of his life in exile. It, uh, he went, he left uh, on a Tanjir boat. Uh, maybe I'll sum it up all in a text, but it's... Uh, he left the United States at a certain point, like Paul Bowles, and lived in exile for a very, very long time. Once he got back to the United States, like most of the people who lived out of their original country, he couldn't really uh, get acclimated reacclimated so easily. So there, there, was, there was this political aspect of not belonging to any place that Edward Said would also follow in his, uh, his, uh, in his writing. Another uh, also political take was that everything that, that people from that generation, uh, avant-garde, that, that was like the early not, not such an early American avant-garde, but that was like the second or the third way of the American avant-garde after Gertrude Stein and Hemingway, uh, people who lived abroad and then returned to the US. Uh, okay, maybe, maybe I'd better say something about all that. I also like, I'd like to thank uh, Ian McFadden for his excellent work on Ira Cohen, which is somehow uh, an incredible revision or revival of everything that Ira Cohen did. Uh, as, as I say, because th this whole legacy was just about to disappear because Ira was not as much present in the United States and part of that heritage as Allen Ginsberg, for instance, who lived in the United States most of his life. So uh, thank you, Ian, and thank you for your wonderful work also on, on Mylar photography and iris photography that inspired me a great deal to, to write certain things. Thank you, Ian, for also for another thing, for being so political. So the question is, what is political? Even if you don't talk about politics, you, you, are, you can be, that's highly political if you avoid politics. That's, that's one thing, but it was so political because uh, the action, the, the real activist, leftist, political, revolutionary action is you don't talk about things like the academics do all the time, that you bring someone who's, like Ian invited Louise Landes Levy, who's sitting here with us and who was one, who is one of the participants of the whole movement, working and being abroad also in exile for so many years from the United States, but also being back and forth. So bringing Louise, it's somewhat like bringing Allen Ginsberg or Ira Cohen on stage. So thank you for having that awareness because uh, the, academy, the academia is so perverse nowadays. I just have to say this, I'll finish. Uh, so perverse that, that us academics, that we, are, we are capable of talking about someone or some movement or some phenomenon for a long time, avoiding the, the real people, the, the real phenomenon sitting in the audience. Okay, so thank you so much. So this part of, uh, I'll make it really short, aware of this time. Th this Kaddish for Ira Khan has several parts. One of them is my short memory of Ira. I picked up the phone that day and learned that Ira was gone. No more of his voice that made so many people laugh, so many people happy. I hated the fact that I wouldn't be able to hear his voice again. I put on the Manjoon Traveler, dedicated to Brian Geisen, produced by Sub Rosa. 
poems and music recorded by Ira Cohen, Paul Bowles, Brian Geisen, Don Cherry, Ornette Coleman, Angus McLeese, DJ Chapman Saba, music recorded in Marrakesh in 1987. These names you could only imagine at your cousin's birthday party, in someone's library and so on. For Ira, they were just a part of his reality. Some of them I met personally, either with Ellen or with Ira or with Hanky, but one thing was for sure, they were part of his daily experience, his own lifestyle, like Ira was a part of my life, and one thing I know, while some friends of his were taking time to write blogs, blurbs, and obituaries for New York Times, I was simply crying. In his poem to Cocteau, and this I've heard accentuated on the tape, he said, Imagine whatever you will, but know that it's not imagination, but experience which makes poetry. And that behind every image, behind every word, there is something I'm trying to tell you, something that really happened. Um, so, uh, okay. Imagine Ira, imagine the day on which I called him from my small Suffolk Street apartment in the city of New York and was ready to go quickly to my legal proofreading job. And Ira had kept me on the phone for hours and I was laughing and laughing, laughing my job out loud. He said he had just arrived from Amsterdam and if I knew there, Eddie Woods, they started the legendary Inside Outs Press, and Louis Landes Levy and Simon Winkenuk. That was a damn good start for our friendship. Hey, hey, he said, if you had known all these people, although I'm not on speaking terms with some of them any longer, nonetheless, they must mean that you are a very nice person. He was able to keep me on the phone for hours. In fact, he was the only person who was able to keep me on the phone longer than five minutes. I say I, but this means we, New York downtown community of a couple of friends, or Upper West Side community of actors, including Judith Molina, that we see here, Judith Molina and Julian Beck of the Living Theater, or the Brooklyn community of musicians, and so on. Ira was not only a long distance telephone chit chat, he was real true blue. He gave me a piece of gold when I was down and out in the street and told me, sell it so that you can get your real apartment. He had a photographic memory, not only a skill to make the incredible photos, great photographer as he was. Ira was a great traveler as well. Now, the journey do not make any sense. Ira is gone. Goodbye happiness. Hello, Dr. Nadar and other creepy creatures. Ira once said, butterfly, meaning me, is small and meaningless, but still it knows how to get to Mexico. Three of us went to the airport and Ira, who did not have a ticket, literally slid through the door onto the plane and then we had so much fun on this lovely trip to Cancun and Chichen Itza. Um, Louise is leaving. Uh, so, anyways, at that time it was still possible. No terrorists, no big checkups, just the journey itself and pure joy of being alive. Ira was a great traveler. Okay, so um, he was staging his photographs carefully. Now stand over here and stand there. We all obeyed his whimsical arrangements. The latter, we saw ourselves on these beautiful, at times scary photos whose meaning was turned upside down to serve his artistic purpose. I saw once a marble pillar sticking like a dick coming out of my head in the MoMA sculpture garden. All this on Iris' photo course. I, I'm gonna try to move uh, the photos. How do I move them? I'm totally, te technologically, I'm totally illiterate. Maybe. Uh. Oh, maybe here? Yes. Oh no, yeah, the, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, thank you, dear. So, uh, Okay, th this, yes? Uh, are you sure? I thought, uh, I thought that was John Rayleigh. Take a look if you had an earring at that time. Sorry? Take a look if, if it were you or John, John Rayleigh. 
John Rayleigh who made an, an anthology, Shamanic Warriors. Yeah, he looks like you. It's fast. It's fast. So many things happen that even if, if it were not you, Ian, but uh, maybe, maybe you, maybe that was a reincarnation of you. John Rayleigh was also uh, in Amsterdam, but as you can tell, we were so, I mean, I was really stoned, but I, I can't speak for other people. Uh, that was in Amsterdam in just before I think uh, Ira passed out, it was like 2006 or seven. Uh, this is, this picture, the, this one was uh, me performing at La Mama because for a long time I worked the Living Theater but then I, I was also doing uh, one woman shows, performances, as, as all the members of the Living Theater. There's no audition for the Living Theater and, and there was no audition and the, the, all the performers were per first performance or performers artists on their own and then they worked. So, um, at that time I was angry with him for having created uh, certain compositions of me but now I say there was Man Ray before Ira and that was it. And he was truly international. He often complained of his loneliness. In one of his poems he said, the way, of the, the way artist is lonely and people are afraid of them. Even God created people because he was lonely. So lonely must be the worst. Like all of us Aquarians, he feared loneliness the worst, and he could even go for the company of the silliest people on this earth, just as not to feel lonely. He held the Aquarians in high esteem. He loved Mozart, he adored Henri Charles Ford, he loved me, at times his muse and favorite camera object, and many other Aquarians one would never think of befriending. He trusted them so much that he never questioned their skills or loyalty, as on that trip to Cancun when he allowed me to take him on that imaginary plane ticket to Mexico. That was a scam, actually. The trip which was purely conceived in my Aquarian skill and manipulation of a tourist agent method. A lovely trip, but all this belongs to the diary of a madman such as Paul Bowles, Ira Cohen, or Angus MacLeese. Ira had never liked Allen Ginsberg, whom I adored, because he acquired more fame than him in many ways, he would say that. Allen had fame, but he had no children, he said. The last time I saw the letter, he said how much he envied Ira for having sons. I was on the verge of tears. I was expecting a baby. Ira came to Paris to be there with me for my delivery. I'll never forget the day when he arrived in Paris. My turn was overdue and Ira was taking me around Paris, making me laugh so that we push that baby out so that he can come out quickly. He was placing different plates and objects on my belly and shooting photos, also reciting his poem from the Akashic Records. I'm not a beat, though I have performed with them all, etc. I'm an electronic multimedia shaman, a Naga hipster, an Akashic agent, an outlaw of the spirit, the flower of chivalry with a sword for a leaf, a lily for a heart. That time in Paris, we went to Alejandro Jodorowsky's cryptic gathering, but later they had a big falling out. I wrote a poem about it much later. It's called Wor World Champions in Good Matters. I'm all dressed in black and silver and I'm carrying Ira's book of black and silver. There are not too many people in this world like Ira, and there are many people like Alejandro Jodorowsky. I hear that once they were friends, now they're enemies. And all the people around Jodorowsky are just like him. I won't name them. Okay, blah, blah. I, I would see Ira on and off on our various travels in London, Paris, New York, and Amsterdam. His trip to London in 2007 stayed in my memory. He was very ill, came down with a bad flu, and the art dealers in his October gallery did not treat him correctly. Thus I wrote the following, Buddha dancers. Thread of light this morning, old friends coming from nowhere, going to no place. We are old souls holding by sheer wit and courage 
our encounters repeat light of multitudes, our repeated lifetimes. In fact, the things turned so sour between him and the gallery owner that I started reflecting deeply on nature of art and the relationship between the artist and an art dealer. Okay, entering our theme of politics. It seemed to me that the artist was always an underdog, neither loved or appreciated by the dealers, but rather exploited all the way through. Here we had a major artist, such as Ira, seriously ill with high fever, and the dealers were ignoring his condition by setting more and more and more appointments with art collectors, not allowing his family to hand him a medication that we bought in a local pharmacy for him, so I wrote this angry poem. It's called a story of an ancient, from an ancient art history book. The artist was there and he was happy. He was bright, temporary in his brio, committed, uncompromising, the uncompromised one. The gallery owner was nervous and eager to appear generous. He started barking, showing his teeth and then his goodwill. He said he was there to help the anonymous. He said he was there to improve the state of arts and the state. He was not to deal with mental patients. He admitted that they were fragile. The artist saw this as a game of power. He said he disliked the master-slave dialectics. He said he wanted to leave and that he couldn't care less as usual. He said he did not care and basically he did not. The gallery owner said that he himself could not care less. He really could not be bothered. He said he was surrounded by all sorts of artists. It almost felt like in a mental asylum, he said. Perhaps it was our Eastern European background, perhaps it was our Aquarian Mickey Mouse Club where we both belonged, but I don't think that anyone understood me better than Ira did. Thus he wrote these truly enlightened words for me on a dedication page on whatever you say may be held against you. To do it without thinking, that is the best. For you, it is essential. I wrote this text without thinking. Okay, there's the second part. I wrote all this without thinking. So their second part is more like, this is Lilia de la Boja, uh, a friend of ours, a poet, a New York poet of Ukrainian origin. And this is, are you ready, Louise? This was 30 or 40 years ago in a New York bar. And here is, um, well, here is Louise that, that you've seen, Louise adoring, uh, adoring the cow. But uh, yeah, let, let's, stay, let's stay with this one a little bit for a couple of minutes. I think, not the cow, oh sorry, the next one is me adoring the cow. This is Louise adoring the pig, with, uh, but the pig has a Russian, yeah, only five minutes. Oh, okay. I'll ban through the whole thing then. Okay. Well, let, let's let's be patient for a second. I'll I'll stop. You know. Let me just read uh, because we've listened to a lot of people also. Who, but I will keep the time. When I quote Cohen, avant-garde poet, cum photographer filmmaker, connoisseur of the dark sides of life, as much of Rebelsian humor. I do it out of my head or my subconsciousness, raking my dearest and nearest memories. I've been trying to liberate the space in my surrealist subconsciousness, invaded by Cohen's images, light and dark. Liquid colors stretch all over the brain's plane for almost a decade. The artist was here, as Marina said, Abramovich, very much present not so long ago. Photography and the process of taking it used to be for Cohen an act of extreme liberty and an act of liberation. It was able to get us out of prison of our dwelling subliminal and real. A surrealist poet once said, surrealism is not something way beyond the real, it is realism on square. In one of his poems, Cohen said that he had always tried to say something real, something that really happened. His photography really happened, his Mylar Chamber Theater, his honoric images happened, as did the act of holding his camera, be it photo camera or film camera. Uh, Ira, Cohen, the for Ira Cohen, the process of making a film was the act of extending his dream images into a prolonged movement, the way the best directors such as Pasolini or Tarkovsky have always done. We witnessed the process of extending photographs better than anywhere else in Cohen's long documentary, 
Kumba Mela festival entitled Kings of the Straw Mats. This massive gathering is huge Hindu religious pilgrimage in which Hindus gather to bathe in a sacred river. It is considered to be the largest peaceful gathering in the world with around 100 million people expected to visit holy sites so dear to Cohen's heart. The, quintess, just this, the quintessence of Cohen's art, both in film and photography, may be observed in this film. However, unlike Pasolini or Jean Renoir, who observe it, Indian society as supreme documentaries, Pasolini notes on film and Renoir Le Fleuve, Cohen documents the location and transforms his vision into a high artistic experience. He becomes one with the vision of India as he is not a casual observer or just a tourist, a traveler, but absorbs this vast country as a dweller. However, much like Pasolini, he is also a great visionary humanist whose Indian themes, religion and hunger remain forever printed in, on his celluloid. He sees the misery of the world as Pierre Bourdieu qualified the world of the underdeveloped underdogs. Cohen sees the lepers, the blind, the hungry, the religious, but unlike Pasolini, his humanism is complemented and nuanced with his surrealist humor. In his film, A Hookah Smoker, A Leper, A Toothless Dancer with Death and His Orphan, all these are people whose social word of the untouchables. Cohen treats with his sense of humanity and with the, his in, undeniable feeling for color and zany idiosyncratic detail. And whereas Renoir talks about bride with the husband chosen by her father, in Cohen we see it all. The bride, the ruined childhood, the father and the groom, as witnessed also in his moving photos from his trip to Ethiopia. And again, there were other documents that describe that Cohen just shoot and recorded the essence of the Indian spirit and Kumbha Mela. I want to add that there's something in favor of Cohen. Ira is a poet and a master of contemporary letters. And these facts add to the miracle which was produced in his work. He trusted 100% in the power of the visual. His mylar photographs are his visual portrayals of people he used to know or did not know. They are speechless, silent, like the deaf parents he grew up with. His documentary, Kumela, is also silent, bereft of textual explanations. It is not non-judgmental, as its author, rather a non-judgmental but critical observation of the world we inhabit, be it the heart of Africa, Asia, or the midst of his 16-panel Myler chamber, where he was an alchemist, a sort of American Victor Browner, concocting images out of the mirror-like reflections with emerge from his panels. Okay, the rest you can see, there's actually a site called uh, Academia Edu, academia.edu, and there's like a larger piece of this work with, with the interview with Diver Cohen also in it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, often people tend to repress these images and this causes a certain kind of uh, pain and distortion. So uh, this is a kind of a free revelation.